Okay, I think we're going to get started here. Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're going to talk about sampling on the blockchain. Uh, I'm John, and I'm from a company called Measure. There's this um, American alpinist by the name of Kelly Cordes, uh, who is famous for these really pioneering ascents in Pakistan and in the Torres in Patagonia. Anyway, um, Kelly has this taxonomy of fun that I really like. And he says there are two types of fun, type one and type two. Type one fun are things that are actually fun. So if you're doing a thing and somebody asks you, are you having fun, uh, and you say, yeah, this is fun, then that's type one fun, right? Puppies, ice cream, water slides. Type two fun are things that you only realize are fun after you finish doing them. And so Kelly, being an alpinist, is very familiar with this. Um, climbing in the alpine is generally pretty horrible. You can be at the end of a 18-hour um, climb, and your feet are sore, and you're cold and hungry, and the strap of the backpack is digging, digging into your shoulder. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, this is just bloody horrible. I don't know why I do these things. Um, and you get back down to your car, and you strip off your wet clothes, and you put on something warm, and you start the drive home. And maybe 15 minutes into the car ride, your mate looks across to you and says, you know what, I bet we could do that in 15 hours. And you take a minute and you think about it, and you respond, yeah, that'd be pretty fun. And the reality is it wouldn't. It would be pretty horrible, just like the horrible thing that you endured. But we have this sort of rapid onset nostalgia that comes over us. Anyway, I mention this because if you've been to any MR conferences over the past year and a half, or if you've um, listened to MR podcasts or hung out, hung out on MR Twitter, you will have seen a number of discussions about blockchain. And in my experience, um, those discussions can be reduced more or less to a string of desirable nouns, right? Things like privacy, transparency, democratization, and so on. And these things are all true, or at least potentially true, um, but they're never cashed out in any way that is useful or satisfying. Um, I would call these the type one blockchain for MR talks. And what I'm going to do today is a type two blockchain for MR talk. So it's perhaps not going to be fun in the moment. Um, but what I want to do is, instead of giving you this 10,000 foot view of what could possibly be and let you figure out all of the details, I want to dive depth first into just a couple of those details um, and give you some sort of visceral sense for what the opportunity space is here. What are we trading off to get there? Um, what do these things look and feel and smell like? Um, and so this is going to be absolutely non-exhaustive, but it will hopefully just um, make the rubber hit the road just a little on what the hell is possible with a blockchain for market research. So most of these talks start out with five to 10 minutes of Blockchain 101. I'm not going to do that. There are many YouTube videos, as was discussed in the, key, the keynote debate just then. Um, they will do a better job than I will. And we don't need to do that um, for the purposes of this. What I do want to do, though, is sort of pull out what I think is perhaps the most salient characteristic of a blockchain in um, this particular context. My co-founder, Paul Netto, <laughs> likes to say that blockchains are slow, expensive databases with one superpower and that's that they can distribute trust. That sounds like an odd thing to do and, and an odd thing to want, but what we're doing here is, you know, we're executing transactions between people, we're paying people for things, and we've got marketplaces um, involved here. And so trust is getting flung around everywhere implicitly. And so when you can um, build trust into software, you get to um, um, produce products that do a whole bunch of new things that weren't possible before. So, a slow, expensive database that distributes trust. Um, I'm going to slip into this sideways via Bitcoin. So I'll assume that you all have a passing familiarity with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is sort of the canonical blockchain. It's the, the first um, cryptocurrency that was built on top of a blockchain. The interesting thing about, um, the, um, about Bitcoin uh, if you think about just the very simple use case for Bitcoin, one person wants to pay another person. Um, the clever thing about Bitcoin is that they can get that done without any intermediary involved. Um, the Bitcoin, the network, 
is comprised of a set of um, computers being run by essentially random people across the internet or running public domain software. Right? Nobody owns Bitcoin, nobody controls Bitcoin, and yet um, it can, through the game theory involved and the cryptography involved, it can engender enough trust in people that they can conduct financial transactions through this thing. So to me, this is most like, oh, there's some weird emoji here. To me, this is most like um, the relationship between a researcher and a respondent, um, which today gets filtered through uh, a sample provider, a panel company, a router, a combination of the two or three, perhaps. Um, and so what my claim here is that uh, we're able to execute this basic data transaction. A researcher wants to buy data, um, a survey response or some passive data from a respondent, that we can execute that with the only intermediary being um, software on a blockchain. So let me say, before I go any further, that the um, point that I'm making here is, is, in some sense, a narrow technical point. I'm not um, suggesting that um, these blockchain solutions are going to disintermediate this industry. I'm not suggesting that the sample business is going away. I'm just making this sort of dispassionate um, uh, technical claim that um, these transactions that we execute millions of times every day, it's possible that they can be um, done using just software on a blockchain. Nobody in the middle. Just like with Bitcoin, we don't have banks involved or governments or, or anything like that we can do this type of, um, or this part of research without any um, uh, trusted entity involved. So I'm just gonna proceed, and um, of course there are lots of big, interesting business questions to ask and answer about this, um, but today we're just gonna focus on what's actually possible. So um, we've got our researcher who wants to buy something from, uh, buy some data from a respondent. So let's dig a little deeper into what that actually means. So I think that there are four jobs to be done in sampling. Recruitment, profiling, sampling, which is sort of um, running some algorithm and picking, picking a representative sample of people and then paying those people. Um, of course, sample companies do um, a, a superset of this and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's not included here. But again, we're just talking about sort of this, this um, core mechanical transaction here. My claim here specifically is that Software on a blockchain can do three of those things, profiling, sampling, and payment. Um, as Seema presciently said in that, in that talk just then, um, recruitment involves sort of bringing people external to this, the system into the system. And so the software on the system can't do that. I mean, we can build a good system that will attract people, but recruitment is sort of outside of the box of this thing. We're just talking about once people are in the system, we can profile them, sample them, and pay them. So let's dig even deeper and look at what that actually means. Okay, so we have a researcher and um, she wants to run a study. So she uses a piece of software that looks just like the software that she uses today. In fact, it could be the software that she uses today. Um, Pegasus from, uh, from Matt or, or Lucid's Fulcrum or um, whatever the case may be, creates uh, what's essentially a sample request that describes what she's looking for um, and that thing gets placed onto the blockchain. The respondent will have a device um, or a piece of software on the device that um, is monitoring the blockchain for these opportunities. Um, the device will pull down that request, take a look at it, and decide whether the respondent qualifies, and if they're interested, they'll raise their hand and they say, I want to participate in this thing. The blockchain then runs a sampling algorithm and spits out uh, offers to a bunch of respondents. The respondent, just like they do today, they go off and take a survey in some external survey in instrument. In this case, I've picked out Confirm It. And again, just like today, um, the survey uh, engine will um, register some uh, event back to, in this case, the blockchain, right? A completion, a disqualification, um, a, a timeout, whatever the case may be. And then the blockchain is able to pay the respondent, right? So nothing. Um, fancy or particularly different about that. This is sort of the simple mechanical description of what goes on when we try to get an individual into a survey. So we call the blockchain a database, which it is, um, but it's a particular type of database. 
So this is sort of a caricature of what, what uh, the stuff on a database might look like. Um, and um, you can see um, a blockchain is a chronologically ordered database, right? So we sort of see events being logged to the thing one by one. So this is a representation of the events that we just described. Um, if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can sort of see that using this information, we're able to derive lots and lots of interesting statistics, all the statistics that we're used to dealing with every day, right? What's the response rate for this study? What's the average take rate for this respondent? Um, how often does this client um, do this type of research, et cetera, et cetera? Now, a couple of things about these blockchain databases. Um, assuming a, a whole set of um, complicated criteria are met, but putting that aside, um, these databases are public, which means that everybody can come and take a look at what's on this thing. Um, everybody is sort of able to do their own forensics as to what happened um, in a research study. Um, um, and secondly, they're immutable, right? This is another word that gets tossed around a lot, and it means a very, very specific thing. Number one, you can trust that what was written to the database has not since been modified. Number two, you can trust that the person that wrote the thing, the person or entity that wrote the thing to the blockchain, is that person or entity. Um, and number three, this is the but. You cannot intrinsically trust the truth of claims that are sitting on the blockchain if they're not to do with things that are in the control of the blockchain itself, right? And so the set of things that are in the control of the blockchain itself is very, very, very small, right? Most of the research that we do, all the research that we do, is out in the world, living in survey engines and living in focus groups and um, various pieces of software, right? And so this is a big problem for us. How do we trust claims about research activity that are made on the blockchain? There is nothing inherent about blockchain that makes us trust what is written there. As we said, we can trust that what was written there has not been changed. We can trust who wrote it. But as for what they wrote, well, it's, it's open season. In the case of cryptocurrencies, they're this nice closed system, right? A, a currency, if you think about it, is just a set of accounts, a set of people who can hold that currency, entities that can hold that currency, and their balance, right? And that database can live on a blockchain. And so when you're interacting with Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, um, the blockchain itself has um, complete knowledge of the entire universe that it's trying to manage here. Um, and so you have this greater level of trust in what's being written there. That's not the case by research. And unfortunately, there's no simple answer to this, right? Every time something gets written to a blockchain, you have to sit back and think, why would we trust this? Or why wouldn't we trust this? And under what circumstances would we trust this? So we're going to go through just a couple of quick examples here to give you a flavor of what that looks like. So let's take the case of the survey engine, right? Why would we or would we not trust Confirmit for writing a, um, a record of a completed survey response to a blockchain? In this case, it's actually pretty easy, right? The, um, the actual customer of Confirmit is the research company. And so to the extent that they want to continue um, to have the research company as a customer, they're just naturally incentivized to tell the truth about what goes on. Um, it's certainly conceivable and theoretically possible that Confirmit could go into cahoots with a couple thousand respondents and say, look, guys, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to write a bunch of completes to this blockchain. You share your compensation with me. Um, now, that's going to work, but it's going to work for a very short period of time because all these researchers are going to say, this is pretty crap. Like, <laughs> I'm running research through this survey engine, and uh, I have no data to show for it. So, um, survey engines, in this particular case, are naturally incentivized to do the right thing. The case of respondents, though, is a little different. Um, what we've said here is that where, um, in our, the scenario that we painted, that we're um, asking respondents to essentially self-qualify into a study, right? And we know that there are just many, many reasons why a respondent would shade the truth when they're qualifying into a survey. Um, and so we have to figure a way around this. But before we do, I want to throw a couple more things into the mix. The database that we looked at has a ton of interesting information on it. It's all public and it's all immutable, which is fantastic, but there's a little bit too much information on here, right? Um, 
on this first line here, we can see that it's open knowledge to everybody that researcher A, and researcher A um, presumably is going to be pseudonymous, so we don't know exactly who researcher A is, but we know that there exists this researcher who is running a study with 100 respondents for men aged over 18. Now, in isolation, that's not really um, interesting information, but you can imagine that over time, if researcher A does lots and lots of studies, and they all tend to focus on particular demographic subgroups, then we might start to figure out who researcher A is, and there's this you know, opportunity for corporate espionage of a sort. We, if we know that Volvo is doing a particular type of research, we could maybe make um, educated guesses about what their product line is gonna look like in the next six months. The bigger problem, though, is actually for the respondent, right? Even though we don't have any respondent data on the blockchain, um, it's pretty easy to infer that any respondent that participated in the study that was looking for men over the age of 18 is, in fact, a man over the age of 18, or at least somebody pretending to be a man over the age of 18, which is our other problem. So we have to fix these things. Problem two is how do we hide sensitive data and problem three is how do we reliably qualify respondents um, without having access to their profile data? So in the current environment, um, this is not really a problem. We have sample provider companies who conveniently have these nice databases that keep all of the respondent data private and keep all of the requests from the researcher private. Um, but we don't get to do that here. Um, we need to find some um, um, syn synthetic version of this. Right, so one thing that we could think about is throwing a database into the blockchain. That would solve our trust problem, right? We no longer have to trust the respondent to tell us who they are, but clearly that's going to exacerbate our um, data sensitivity problem, and so that's no good. Um, in a lot of uh, cryptographic networks, uh, you have this role called a miner. So in Bitcoin, you have Bitcoin miners, right? And Bitcoin miners are generally um, people that participate in a network and provide some resources to the network or some function to the network and get paid somehow um, for doing so. Um, in the case of Bitcoin, you're providing computation and storage and you're getting paid in Bitcoin for doing that. So perhaps we could introduce something that we might call a profile miner, which would keep respondent profiles and researcher requests in the database sitting off the blockchain, right? Now this would theoretically work, um, but it looks a whole lot like the situation that we have today, except we've got this big, slow database sitting in the middle of it, right? And we're still, we've still got somebody that we have to trust to keep our data safe, and we have to pay them fees for doing it, um, but we have to go through this um, blockchain in order to make it work. So this is not ideal either. So what we did is went looking around for some cryptography to solve some of these things. We found these things called um, bit commitment schemes or cryptographic commitment schemes. Um, so these are schemes which allow you to um, commit to a thing publicly without, um, without revealing what that thing is. And in the literature, the canonical problem that this solves is flipping a coin over a phone call, which is clearly a problem that plagues humanity. So let's have a look at how this works. So we've got researcher A who's bored and is calling up her friend researcher B, and they're gonna flip a coin. Researcher A is gonna be the coin flipper, and researcher B is gonna be the one that calls heads or tails. So the problem in this scenario as it stands is that if researcher B calls heads or tails before researcher A flips the coin, then researcher A is likely to lie about the result. Um, similarly, if researcher A announces the result before researcher B calls the coin flip, um, then uh, researcher B is likely to lie about what she chose. Um, so, so this is the analogy here is, is asking, for, asking a respondent for um, what their profile is. So what we can do here is researcher B can um, decide what she wants to call. In this case, it's tails. Tails never fail. What she does here is not tell it to researcher A, but she can send this thing called a commitment to tails to researcher A. Now this commitment is, um, it, it's like a box, but, it, but the, the reality is it's this long string of numbers and letters that are essentially impenetrable and completely opaque to researcher A. But researcher A can hang on to that thing. They then do the coin flip, it comes up tails, Researcher B says, that's great, that's what I had. And to 
prove it, I'll send you this opener for Tails, right? And again, this is like this little encrypted string that researcher A can then apply to the commitment that, um, that was sent. And it's like putting a key into a box and she can open it up and reveal that her choice was in fact Tails. And the key thing here is that this is not just a piece of encrypted data that you can send the password for or the key for. The, the, the structure of this is that the mathematics will satisfy researcher A that um, researcher B could not have chosen anything other than tails, right? There exists no um, opener for heads that um, researcher B could have sent to researcher A to reveal something that she hadn't chosen. So um, we took this plus uh, another few bits and pieces from the crypto pantry, and we came up with this thing called proof of profile. Um, so the way proof of profile works is that a researcher, just as before, um, uses a piece of software to um, create a sample request. Um, but in this case, the sample request is, uh, has the targeting portion, the sensitive data, encrypted. Right? So then that goes onto the blockchain. The respondent, using the same device, the same software as before, is able to pick up that request, and the respondent has no idea what this targeting, what targeting is being requested. Right? It's just a string of, of characters and numbers. It's completely impenetrable. But there's a little piece of math that can be run that allows the respondent to compare that to the profile that they're storing on their device. Right? So the key thing here is that there's no central database in any of this scenario. We have a respondent here with a big detailed profile about themselves on their device. Um, and they've been given this um, encrypted string that they don't know what it is. They don't know what's being asked for. But they can run a little bit of math that produces a result that will tell researcher A and tell the blockchain whether or not they qualified for this study. And again, just like the bit commitment scheme, um, qualifies them for the study in such a way that the researcher is convinced that they could not have answered otherwise. Right? So this is proof of profile. This allows us to qualify respondents into studies without having access to a database that has respondent information. If we have a look at what um, lands on the blockchain, what we get to do is essentially redact the sensitive portion here. We get to keep all of the good stuff that we want, all of the um, forensics, all of the transcript of what happened and who did what, when. Um, but uh, we have the sensitive data turning into just this um, um, opaque uh, string of numbers and letters. So we've overcome our first problem. And now um, researcher B comes to us and says, this sounds good. I want to run this big honking tracker study. Can you do that for me? And the problem is we don't have a database to look up to see how many of certain types of people we've got in there. So now, because we've given up our central database, um, we now have a feasibility problem. How do we determine feasibility? So again, we um, went back to the uh, crypto pantry, as it were. Um, and what we found were these um, cryptographic voting schemes. So these are really clever schemes that allow, um, this is for voting in elections and so on, right? And these um, allow voters to vote in such a way that they can be convinced that their vote is counting, but they can also keep their vote private at the same time. So these are, um, there's a long history of literature about this, and these are um, sort of being proposed for electronic voting systems. So let's have a look at how that works. Uh, I put together a little Brexit example here. So we've got citizen one, and she comes, and she is voting leave. Um, and what she does is, instead of putting her vote into the voting machine, she encrypts it first, and she gets this number of, um, uh, this, this long um, number. And that's what goes into the voting machine. And citizen two does the same thing, and so on and so forth. So, um, if we were to have access to the unencrypted versions of the election, it would be easy for us to just add them up and decide that um, stay one, three to two. But all we have access to is these encrypted versions, right? And so um, what we can do is there's this form of encryption called homomorphic encryption. Um, and it's weird, but what it allows you to do is to perform operations on the encrypted versions of things such that they um, give you the same result as performing operations on the unencrypted versions of the things, right? It's like, um, you know, you have those 
um, boxes in movies sometimes where there's something radioactive or toxic inside and you put your hands in gloves and you can manipulate the thing. Um, imagine if one of those boxes was, was opaque, completely black. So you could put your hands in the gloves and do work on the thing, but you, um, you're not 100% sure what the actual thing is. Um, that's kind of what's going on here with um, homomorphic encryption. And so in this case, what we want to do is we want to figure out what's the sum of um, one of these votes. So that we want to, to figure out the sum of the stay votes. And it turns out that there's this one flavor of um, homomorphic encryption whereby you can multiply the encrypted versions of votes, and what you get is this big long number, and then there's a decryption key that we can get, and we can decrypt that number, and what we get is the result. And so the beautiful thing about this is that um, voters, when they come to vote, they can um, take their number, the, the, the encrypted version of their vote, um, so they can keep it as a receipt. We can take all of these votes and we can post them on a public website, right? So every, and we can even have people's names against these votes because there's no way to get from this encrypted number here back to leave or stay, right? Not only that, we can have the decryption key out in public and we can, we can have the, the algorithm that gets you from the big long number to the decrypted version, right? And so everybody at home after the election's been run can download the whole country's votes and essentially um, uh, resolve what the election was. And so um, there's clearly, surveys are just clearly like voting, right? And feasibility in particular is like voting your profile. So we came up with this thing called um, private network characterization. So um, in private network characterization, we have our citizens who are now respondents, and instead of voting in a particular election, they're voting um, a particular um, aspect of their um, demography or psychography, right? So um, citizen one here, this is her gender and she encrypts that. This is her occupation and so on and so forth. Um, now, all we have access to on, on the server in any centralized location is this long list of numbers. Um, we, and these numbers can't be sort of reverse engineered into what um, a particular individual was or for a particular attribute, but what we get out of this thing is um, audience composition, um, histograms for each sort of demographic and psychographic attribute that we want to measure. So um, let me sort of review where we were here. We've now been able to run a basic end-to-end um, -end sampling process using software on a blockchain without any um, central entity involved. We've been able to do this without having a database that exists with um, people's uh, information anywhere in existence. So it's not just that we've done a good job protecting people's sensitive data, it's that people's sensitive data is scattered onto their devices in a million places, right? And so there is literally nothing to protect at this point. Um, we've been able to figure out a way to do population statistics so that we can run um, feasibility studies and we can characterize the composition of the network. Um, and we've been um, able to do this with this useful side effect that everything that we've done comes with this nice um, chronological, immutable, public, strategically redacted transcript of what went on. So everybody can go in, buyers, you know, um, buyers can come in and see what are the specifics, the specific characteristics, um, behavioral characteristics around the people that um, responded to this survey. Um, Respondents can come in and say, all right, I know what I was paid for this study, but what was, um, but wh what was paid for me on the other end? So there's, this is obviously just scratching the surface and this um, a sample company does not make, um, but we've been able to sort of walk through how we would solve the basic use case here. And there's a ton of other things that we could talk about, um, which we won't today, but just for the purpose of mentioning them. Um, what we've done with proof of profile is we've, um, we've made it such that um, we can trust that um, a user is not manipulating their profile in order to um, uh, comply or qualify for a particular study. But we still have got, we're, we're still no more trusting that the user is who they say they are. And so there's this um, whole discussion to be had about how do we validate the truth value of those claims. 
Um, obviously, when building a system like this, we're sort of slinging around um, uh, descriptions about demography and psychography. And so we've got this problem where we need to um, all agree on a lingua franca, a shared taxonomy of some sort. Uh, and what we've been working on is not just a shared taxonomy, but an extensible one where you can have sort of um, category specific and vendor specific um, extensions to this, um, to this taxonomy to sort of make these things useful in practice. Once you've got a taxonomy in place and you've got this sort of payment infrastructure um, and data validation infrastructure, then it becomes very, very easy to start thinking about data reuse opportunities. Um, data reuse sounds good, but you have a huge taxonomy problem, right? Um, even the simplest questions have many, many different versions across different research companies and different clients. And so we have to work incredibly hard to come up with um, taxonomies that um, allow for this. Um, blockchains are particularly good for reputation systems, right? So now that we've got all of this in place, um, we're able to um, very um, easily allow for feedback mechanisms in both directions, right? We can allow researchers to mark um, badly behaving respondents, but we're also able to allow respondents to um, mark badly behaving researchers. Um, so if a study was claimed to be 15 minutes long and it was actually 25, um, or if it was claimed to be mobile friendly and it was not, uh, these things can be, can be tracked and we can sort of build algorithms to, um, to, to manage these um, reputation scores and we can um, create um, incentive systems in order to incentivize people to optimize their reputation scores. Um, there's this um, idea that we have internally around encrypted survey data. So what I've described to you today sort of gets us to the point where we've got respondents, we can get them into studies properly sampled and, and qualified um, without anybody having to disclose any information that they, that they um, want to keep private. Um, we think that it's possible to go even further than that. We think it's possible for um, survey engines and certain reporting systems to um, do their work um, only using, or at least only keeping, encrypted versions of these data. Um, and so, uh, again, we're just sort of pulling ever more on this thread of privacy and, and, and data sensitivity. And finally, um, we have this um, whole set of thinking around communities. So. Um, you know, I said up front that we sort of do three out of the four jobs. We do the profiling, sampling, and payment, um, but we still have to figure out how do we get people into this system in the first place. Um, and so one of, that ways, one, of the, one of the ways we're doing that is through communities, is through um, finding ways to work with existing panels or existing publishers that have populations of respondents and figuring out what is their what is their role in this network? How do they get compensated? How do they interact with the network? How do they um, control what goes on with the people that they introduce to the network? Um, so uh, these are all things that we're kind of in various stages of, of thinking and, and working through. Um, and there's really interesting discussions to be had, um, um, not dissimilar to sort of the introductory part of this uh, uh, today. Um, so clearly, all of this is just, again, the technical part of this. Um, what's next is figuring out how and what this means for the business. As I said early on, um, I don't at all um, think that this is going to put sample companies out of business or that, um, um, or that this is a, a sort of some big um, push for disintermediation. But I do think that there's a real opportunity here. And I think just like any other technology, this, if it works and if it gets to scale, is likely to change the things that um, companies in the sample business um, uh, put focus on and change perhaps the ways that they um, derive revenue. So um, that's my talk about blockchain. I hope that was useful. <laughs>